start in Psalms chapter 96. I'm going to read that whole chapter, and then I'm going to read the whole chapter, Psalms 100. Psalm 96 says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his, show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. And then Psalms 100, Make ye a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come for his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth all generations. Now, I had a lot of reading there in Psalms 96 and Psalms 100, but, and I'm not going to get directly to that, but I am going to come back to that in my lesson because I think there is a lot, a lot of learning there about praise just in those two verses, just in those two chapters. There is a lot talked about praise and, and a lot of different ways of praise, but I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to be talking about how the Lord is greatly to be praised. And I'm not going to be talking about just praise. I'm going to be talking about worship. Many times I've talked about how worship and praise are similar, not quite exactly the same. So I'm going to bring in praise and worship. And I want to talk about how worthy God is of all the praise that we could possibly give him. There are some saying we have wondered sometimes if we really believe it. We say it all the time that God is greatly to be praised. He is He's wonderful. He's mighty. I mean, we sing songs about it, even the one we just said. I'll, I will bless his name. I'll praise the Lord. We say them a lot, but sometimes we have to kind of look internally and check ourselves, exactly what Cade was talking about. Sometimes we have to check ourselves. Do I really believe he's worthy? Do I, do I actually understand why I praise him, or am I just going through the motions? Am I just saying the words? Do I really see him as worthy of praise? I've, mer I've said many times in, in different times teaching the youth or in prayer, I've said, if I praised him from now till the day I die, it's still not enough praise. I could say it from now to forever. God, if he didn't do anything else good for me and I still praised him for the rest of time, it still would be enough that I cannot praise him enough. And those things are easy to say, but sometimes we need to check ourselves and just check in and make sure why we know that he is so great. So uh, for those who don't know, we kind of get the lessons that we teach out of this book that Pastor gave, gives, gives us. And uh, they had a wonderful, a wonderful little explanation of this story. And I want to read this because it really applies to where I'm going to go with this lesson right now. So try to put yourself into this story. Maybe if you don't put yourself in that story, kind of imagine it as best you can. This is someone, is, he's writing about a story in the Bible, but he's trying to relate it to natural times. It says, the story begins, you're a young man, your country is at war, and you volunteer to fight. You're not drafted, you sign up freely because you believe in the cause. In your very first battle, you're the linchpin, you're the deciding factor that tips the scales in your favor. You're the hero to the nation. Upon returning from the battlefield, they throw you a ticker tape parade and end up being promoted to general as a reward for your bravery. You marry the woman of your dreams. You buy a house. You continue to lead your army to victory after victory after victory. You become a household name across the entire country. But then the leader of your country gets jealous of your success and the beloved reputation of all the people and decides to try to kill you. You barely escape by sneaking through a window, and, and your wife has to stay behind to cover for you. Now you're running for your life, hiding out in all different parts of the country, in the caves. 
You're doing things that you never even conceived of having to do. You have to lie to great men of God. You have to lie to your pastor to get him to help you and end up getting him killed. You're so scared for your life and your family that you, you get your family and spirit them off to a different country, and you have to go completely off the grid, and you end up camping in a cave just to try and save your own life. Your only little bit of help comes from a misfit bunch of rogues who happen to start showing up at the cave. Some are just dodging depths, some are thieves, and even worse. And all of these, just by virtue of showing up, expect you to be their leader and to feed them and to, to show them how to live. As the numbers grow greater, this is not only a problem of how are we going to ha handle this, but it's a whole lot harder to hide. By the time that you get a whole bunch of people following you and things seem to start going good, you get the leader of the country gets word of where you are and the manhunt is on again. You will spend years on the run, sleeping rough in the dirt and the rocks, eating whatever you can find, and starving when you cannot. You live in constant fear. Now, somebody lived this life, and his name is David. His name is David. I like how this book tried to relate it to something we could understand using some of today's language, but David lived this life. From one moment, he was the leader. He was the, the great warrior of the whole country. Won battle after battle, struck down Goliath in his first battle, a man who the people loved. But in an instant, his whole life was flipped around. And he was not only considered to be, and I'm sure that, I'm pretty sure that Saul not only tried to kill him, but I, as much as why we know how people are, I'm sure some lies started to spread about him. So this man who was once the greatest man in the country and the one who Saul had slain his thousands and David slain his ten thousands, this man who was so great is now probably called the thief and the robber and the, the one who doesn't have it all together and is being sought to be dead. Now you would consider how much of that time that he had, all the time and energy he had to run away, how could he possibly praise God? How could he possibly find time with all that he's, he's running for his life, trying to find food, trying to provide for 600 people that have joined himself to him? How could he even find time to praise? But you know that a lot of these psalms were written in the exact time that he was running for his life. A lot of these psalms were written while he was trying his best not to get killed by Saul. It, it doesn't make any sense how he could still, in some of the worst moments of his life, still find a reason to praise God. David had great many moments on top of the world where people were singing his praises, but he also had times where he was hiding for his life. But yet through it all, he found something to praise God for, something he, he decided that I'm going to praise God regardless of what was going on. No matter what came up against him, good times or bad times, he found, he, he found, he got this understanding that the Lord is still worthy of praise. And how could he possibly do that? I think David had a grasp on something that we need to really understand as Christians. Not that we don't, but sometimes we need to be reminded. I think he had a grasp of an understanding that something that is very beneficial to all of us. First, not everything, goes, and not everything that goes right or wrong is caused by God blessing or punishing you. David could have become angry when Saul was after him and wanted to kill him. He could have became angry at God. God, why would you let this happen? But David understood it wasn't God that was fighting against him. Saul made a choice. It was Saul's choice. Saul could have chose to be a good man of God, but Saul chose against the will of God, and that's why Saul has become evil. He, he got this idea that he understood God is not the one trying to kill me. Saul is. God has not changed the fact that he's still good. God has not changed the fact that he will still care. He never got mad of God because of it, because he understood the Lord did not do this to me. Saul did. This world is an evil place. Sin is here. Okay? We, we're surrounded by people who make good decisions and people who make some very, very bad decisions. Sin is in this world. So some of the things that happen to us or happen in the around us, they don't happen because God hates us, but we happen because we're in a world full of people who make bad decisions. Whether that be my bad decisions or whether that be somebody else's bad decisions that affects me because, because I'm around. Because sometimes you can get in trouble just for being in the same area of somebody else. So sometimes when things happen to us, God's not just punishing you. 
And it's just true that sometimes God does put things in your life. There's times where God brings you through things. You know, the song says, he brought me through the fire. Sometimes he does put you in situations, but every time something goes wrong, it's not God who's fighting against you. Sometimes it's just because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where people make good decisions and bad decisions. And as I said before, it's sometimes it's somebody else's decisions, and I don't point any fingers at anybody else, but sometimes we have to admit it's my fault that this is happening to me. Because of my choices, this thing is happening to me. I can't just look at the good things or the bad and say, well, God is doing this to me. I believe that God will shield us from certain things. God will protect us. But sometimes life just happens. Life just happens. I love the way Pastor says it when he says, if your tire is flat tomorrow morning, I don't think it's the devil attacking you or the Lord testing you. I think your tire is just flat. Whether that be my choice, I didn't check the tire, or because of somebody who left some trash on the road that I happened to run over. Sometimes life just happens to us. And I think David got a good grasp on this. Sometimes things that happen bad to us is just because we live in a bad world. He says, I can notice that all this bad stuff that's happening to me, I don't have to attribute this and say, God, you're not worthy. I can look at the bad stuff and say, this just happened because I live in a fallen world. God is still good anyways. He got that understanding. He, he got that grasp. Even when things go wrong, it didn't change the fact that God is good. God is still good. There are times when we could say that God has his hand in this or the devil was attacking, but that's not always the case. So when things go wrong, it takes nothing away from the fact that God is still on the throne, and it takes nothing away from the fact that God is good. There's a song, and I don't have this in my notes, but I actually I listened to it many times this week because it's a really, really good old song, and the chorus just simply says, God's been good in my life. I'm, I am blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep at night each night. And I love in the verse he says, I've, I've seen a lot of problems, but he says, I've had more gains than losses, and I've known more joy than hurt. So there's no better way to say it than God's been good. Because he understood things happen bad, things happen good. But, you know, when I really look at it, God never changed the fact that he's good. It never changed the fact that God has been good to me. I go through some hard times. I go through some rough times, especially one thing that we always tell people who just, just decide to give their life to God. We tell them, don't expect the bed of roses to start coming up because you're going you're gonna to fight some battles. Some things are going to happen. But the best understanding that we can get in our Christian walk is it does not change the fact God is good. God has been good, and he will always be good. And I put in here, now, now let's just be uh, real for a second. It's easy to praise God when times are good. I know that we say we got to praise him when the times are bad, but if we're just real with ourselves, it's easier. I don't have to fight so many, I don't have to fight my flesh so much to praise him when things are good. I know you say, we, we say that you should worship God regardless. That is very true. But I also like to deal with reality. Yes, it's true. It's easier to worship God when things are going right. So when things are going wrong and you're feeling the weight of life, you're struggling. Yes, it's true. I don't expect you to dance with the same vigor and the same zeal that you have when everything is going good. Yes, it's true that your praise and your worship may differ because of the situations in your life. As long as you get that same understanding God did not change. He's still good. If I dance before him because I feel the great wonder of blessings, but even when the times are bad and when the, that old, the other song that says, I'll praise him in this storm, maybe when things are going all wrong, maybe I don't have that zeal to dance, but I can still lift a hand and say, God, you've been good. You've been good. This is a great understanding that David had that kept him strong, that gave him strength and made him write these psalms, even in the times where things were all going wrong. He had the understanding, good times, bad times, God's still good. He's still good. There's a song that I used to sing, and I actually sing this song a lot when I was going through hard times. And many, probably everyone in here probably know this song, and it says, I can't complain. It says, sometimes the clouds hang low, and I'd like to see them go. And I ask this question, Lord, why so much pain? But when I look about and I think these things all out, 
All of the good things outweigh the bad things. I can't complain. So yes, you will go through hard times, you'll go through good times, but as long as we can get that understanding, he's greatly to be praised, whether I'm living in the good times or whether I'm living in the bad times. I can't blame him when things go wrong, and I can't, I can't treat him like he's a better God when things go right. He's good. When I really look at everything he's done for me, he's good. In the good times and in the bad times, he has been a good God. Because God has been faithful. Now, hopefully, I've proved a point, and maybe I've got this point across, that God is worthy to be praised regardless of the situation. Regardless of what is going on in your life, God is worthy to be praised. And you look at the things, a lot of people, it's easy to forget the things that God has had for you. And this isn't even in my notes. This is actually something else that was going on in my mind. But it's easy to forget what God has done for you. And I heard a, a great man of God once tell me, there's three things you always have to know. You got to remember where God brought you from. You got to remember where God puts you now and where God is taking you. It's easy sometimes to see where we are right now. That's easy. We live in the present. You can't live in the future. You can't live in the past. We live in the present. So it's easy to keep up with what's going around you. And sometimes it's a little harder to see about the future. God doesn't always tell us what's in the future. But we need to never forget the past. I don't want to be reminded of all the horrible things I've done. I don't want that. But I don't want to forget where God brought me from. God brought me for some very big things. Because even if they're not, and I've tried to make this a point, even if they're not big to somebody else, they were big to me. There's another song that comes to mind that says, I was there when it happened. I guess I ought to know. I know what God brought me from. Even if it's not a big thing to you, you know, I've, I've heard some people, when they say, God brought me out of this, and you're like, well, that wasn't, that wasn't that bad. I mean, God brought you out of that. But to them, that was a mountain. That was something they had to face. Even if it was nothing to you, that's a battle they had to face. So don't ever forget where God brought you from. Because that's what will make you, that's what will give you that understanding God's been good regardless. Uh, a lot of, and there's even been something that has come to mind here recently. I listen to a lot of different, different viewpoints because I want to understand things. And sometimes this world tries their best to make you doubt God. They try their best to make you think, you know, this world would exist without God because of this scientific theory, or we can explain away God. And they try their best to do that. But I noticed something. Even if they could make me doubt, when I look back, and I look back at the things God has done in my life, there's no way you could prove to me there's no God. Because when I look back, looking forward, I may not see all he's doing. And I don't see all he's doing now. He does things behind the scenes. But when I look back, hindsight's twenty twenty. when I look back and I see God did this and it worked out perfectly, and God did this and it worked out perfectly, when I look back, you can't prove to me God's not real. So let's never forget what God did back then, where he's brought me to now and where we're going. So when we look back, we can know for a fact he's worthy to be praised regardless of where we are right now. Now I want to take just a minute and teach on how do we praise the Lord. Let me ask a question to all, all parents, anybody who's ever had a child. I'm not a parent, but to all the parents of children. Did you have to detail and teach your kid how to breathe, how to eat? How to, uh, sometimes you help them along on how to walk. Yeah, you may help them along, you can encourage them, but most of the time it happens kind of naturally. You give them a toy, what do they do? stick it in their mouth and try to eat it. They, they learn these things. These things kind of happen naturally. They learn to breathe. They learn to eat. They learn to do these things pretty naturally. And it becomes a very natural thing for them to do, to be mobile, to breathe, to eat. I was listening to a podcast this week about praise, and they said something that I, I, I've never really thought about it that way, but it's very true. Humans have a natural desire to praise something. We have a natural desire to praise something because just as we are, we find something to look up to. We find something to idolize, whether that be sports team, whether that be a, a athlete that we really like, an actor or an actress or, or some role model that we have in our life. We find something to look up to. It's natural. We do it just as humans. We find something that we can give praise to. 
It's as normal as breathing to find something to praise. Even the dictionary describes praise as expressing admiration. We find sports teams we admire. It's in our human nature. We find role models. We admire these things. Now, to really teach to praise, we need to understand that God is greater than all of those other things. We have to put him in that place. It's a natural thing for us to find something to praise. Now, the things that you like are different than the things that I like. There are some people who go wild for sports teams, and I really don't care. It really doesn't make a difference to me about what sport team does this or does that. It doesn't make a difference. But there are some things that's easy for me to find something to admire that may not be of any interest to you. But it's because of our natural interest, we look for something to praise. It's a little bit harder sometimes to praise God because he lives outside of the world that we live in. He's bigger than we are. He does things outside of our view. You know, I've heard many people, you know, if God would just come down to earth, I'd praise him. Well, of course you would. Anybody would. I, actually, I truly believe what Revelation says. When he comes down, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. It's impossible not to look the Lord in the face and praise him. So, of course, if he came down, yeah, I, I guarantee you would call him Lord. So it's sometimes hard to praise him because he is so far beyond us. We have to prove to ourselves, to this flesh, about who he is. We have to keep telling ourselves, hey, he's actually God. He's not just a figurehead. He's not just something that we call God. He actually is God. He actually created this world. We have to line up our natural desire to seek something to praise with the only thing that's truly worthy of praise. The sports team, you can get excited, sure, but they're not worthy of your praise. They're not worthy of your praise. There, there is nothing that that sports team has done that's worthy of your praise. There's nothing any actor or actress or role model that has ever done that's worthy of your praise. We all, I, I love the way the podcast put it, we're all, regardless of what you find a praise, we're all the creation. The only thing worthy of praise is the creator. So we have to keep telling ourselves. We, we naturally seek something to praise. Well, I'm trying to give you something that's only worthy of praise. The only thing worthy of praise is God. God is the only one worthy of praise. So if our natural response is to have admiration towards something and praise something, then we need to put God in that place. Then how do we praise God? We need to know how to praise God. And these two chapters that we that we uh, read at the opening, I'm going to read them again because they have a lot of things in here that they say is praise. Uh, before, before I actually deal with this, I, wanna, I didn't have this in my notes. Everybody praises different. Everybody praises different. And everybody has more, some people have more exuberant praise, and some people have a little bit more laid-back praise. And let me tell you what, as long as you are praising God, as long as you're putting an effort towards to praise God, then that's all you need to do. I, I, I agree that sometimes there are times that we need to be more exuberant with our praise, and there are times where we need to be a little held back. But however you praise the Lord, if you are putting God in that position of you are God, then your praise is what, was what's desired. However you praise him is not, and uh, for those who have extremely exuberant praise, I do believe that there are things that the Bible says should be done decently and in order. I do believe that is true. Exuberant praise can sometimes need to get, I don't, I don't want to say toned down, but needs to sometimes be decently and in order. That's true. But we need to praise the Lord. However praise comes to you, you need to praise the Lord. So let's talk about some of these ways that we praise things. Psalms 96, these first two verses say, Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. So he said multiple times there, sing a new song. Singing a song is a form of praise. Singing a song, even if you don't have a good voice, singing a song is a form of praise. Because whether or not, you know, I, I agree with what, with what Kate even said before, we don't need to worship to the beat of the song. But music helps us get into a place of praise. 
It has been that way since the beginning. I mean, you look back at these old, these old prophets and ministers. Even David, when he really needed to hear from the Lord, he said, bring me the minstrel. Play some music. Get, I need to get into a place where I can kind of get into my own place where I can find God. Music, singing helps praise the Lord. It's a way that we can praise him. That's why even, even in this lesson, I've brought up three or four different songs because how many times have I just had a bad day or a good day and I turn on a song and it just reminds me how great the Lord is. And it just brings me to a place of reminding me God's been good or God, or I can't complain. All of those songs can help me praise the Lord. And when I sing that song with my voice, that's the reason that singing is important. When we sing these songs up on the board, we don't put the words up here just so you can sing along and let's have a chorus. That's not the purpose. It's so you can see what is being said and you can say that to the Lord. When it says, I will bless the Lord, it's not just a chorus, let's all get it together. No, it's saying, I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm singing this out. I will praise the Lord. When it says, I've got a song or I've got a praise, that's, a, that's not just a song. It's something that I'm going to see and I'm going to give that to God. Lord, I have a praise. I've got something I need to give to you. And that's what these songs are for. That's why when I was young, the beat of the song was important. The beat of the song was extremely important. But as I've gotten older, I can't get over some of those old songs. Those words were so powerful. Those words were so good. Some of those songs where it says, that I, the one song that I play almost every single week is just, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. If you could go with me back to where God brought me from, then you would see I'm just a sinner saved by the mighty grace of God. Those words are so powerful. Even, even some of the songs I used to listen to as a kid, and uh, maybe you know the band, maybe you don't, but they had a song that was called Slow Fade. It's a slow fade. Those words were so powerful. I missed them when I was a kid, but when I go back and listen to them now, and it says, be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's the second glance ties your hands while darkness pulls the strings. Those words, they mean a lot. So when I sing a song, I'm not just singing to the beat. I have words that mean something that I can give unto God. That's how singing can praise the Lord. Verses 3 through 6 of Psalms 96 say, Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. The beginning verse there said, declare his glory among the heathen. Can I tell you one of the greatest forms of praise you can give is your testimony? Because how else will the world know what God has done for you? God does great things for his people, but somebody has to say, look what the Lord did for me. That's some of the greatest praise that you can give to the Lord. Say, let me go tell the world all the great things you've done for me. The times that you've brought me out of depressing times and the times that you've helped me when financials weren't enough, the times you gave me peace when all I had was turmoil, that's testimony. That's praise I can give to God. When I tell somebody about the glory of God and how wonderful he's been and how great he's been and how he is the one only true God, that's praise that I can give to him. Testimony is not only helpful to the other person, but it's also a praise to God. So if things have happened in your life, I get that sometimes we can't always give testimony. You know, if you always give testimony, people might start avoiding you because some people are not all that interested. But every now and then, I just like to tell somebody, you know, I used to struggle with that. But, you know, because I know God, because God did this, because God did that, I no longer have to do that. Or I can tell somebody who's going through a really struggling time, I can say, well, you know what, I went through a time like that. And then God gave me peace. Not only does that help them, but I can say the glory of God. This is how God, this is how great the Lord is. I can give a testimony. That is praise to God. Verses seven and eight. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. The one where most most preachers kind of start to Everybody starts kind of clenching up. Giving to the Lord is praise. And I say giving because I don't say just money. I say giving to the Lord. We give to the Lord in many ways. We give of our time. We give of our talent. We give of our treasure. Pastor has taught on that before. 
giving to the Lord is praise. Because does God need my money? No, he doesn't. God could do whatever he needs to. God could make a million dollars up here. Now, he hasn't for me, and he probably never will. But he could. If he wanted to, he could snap his fingers and do whatever he wants to do. He doesn't need my money. But it's praise to him that I say, I'm putting this in your hands, God. I know that you are going to do good things. I'm going to give back to you. In fact, that even works in today's standards. Um, Do you want to know one of the reasons giving is praise? Is because if you pitch me an idea and I don't believe in it, I'm not going to give you any money. If you pitch me, hey, here's an idea and I need some, I need some money to make this idea happen. If I don't like the idea, I'm not going to give money into that because I, I don't really like that idea. So one of the things when we give to God, it's not just because I'm supposed to. It's, God, I believe you're actually doing good things. So I'm going to give of my time, talent, and treasure because I believe you're actually doing something good. When I give to the church, when I give to God, it's saying, Lord, I believe you have a good plan. I believe you are doing a good thing. I don't believe that you're kind of messing things up or you're stirring the waters when you shouldn't. I believe, Lord, you are going to heal people around here. Lord, I believe you are going to help some of the people in this city. I believe it. And so because I believe it, I'm going to give in support. I'm going to give in support of what you're doing because I believe your plan is good. So giving is, is praise unto God. And of course, giving is always kind of tough because giving of, of our abilities and our time and our talent is tough. Because especially uh, when you're young, you have a lot of free time. Cade mentioned that. Uh, of course, I think he was kind of be a little joking there. But uh, you do have a lot of time, and that time does get smaller. As you get older, your time is important. I, I, I make this, I think I... I don't even mean to, but I think I mention this every time I teach. I have a bigger to-do list than I'll ever get to. I just have a, I have a book full of stuff I want to get accomplished, and I don't have the time. Time is important. So the fact that you find something, God, I believe you can do a great thing in this service, so I'm going to take some time, and I'm going to pray for this service. I'm going to take some time and I'm going to put some effort towards teaching in Sunday school or I'm going to put some effort towards singing or or I'm going to put some effort towards this or that. Time is important. That is praise to God because I can tell God, I believe what you're doing is not on accident or mistake. I believe it's a good plan and I'm going to support it because I believe in you. That's praise. Verse 9, oh, worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness, fear before him all the earth. I don't have a lot of time to kind of deal with this difference between praise and worship. But it said, worship him in the beauty of holiness. I believe holiness is not, is not just our standards. It is our standards. That is holiness. But I believe that holiness is being separated, called by God. He said, be ye separate and apart from the world. And he said, be ye holy, for I am holy. How we worship the Lord is in our obedience to the Lord. That is a worship. That is a praise to God. Because uh, this isn't even in my notes, and I hope this is a good, a good way to get it across. Those who have been parents, you know you're, you, don't feel any, you can't feel any more joy than when your child actually did something that you asked. You know, because kids are pretty rebellious, especially younger ones, you tell them to do something and they didn't hear it. Well, they did hear it, but they act like they didn't hear it. And so when you say something and the child actually listens and obeys, it almost, it almost just brings a smile to your face. It's just like, wow, they actually, they actually listened. I wonder if sometimes, and hopefully this is not the case, I wonder if God is sometimes the same way. He speaks to us and he's like, wow, they actually listened. I believe obedience is one of the greatest forms of worship and praise we can give to God. Because one reason, and and I'll put it this way, when I was young, I was rebellious too. I had a mean streak. Uh, I was more introverted, so I didn't get in trouble as much. I stayed in my room and didn't do much. But I had a rebellious mean streak. I had my own problems. And uh, I remember I was asleep over at somebody's house one night, and he was trying to get me to play a game that I wasn't supposed to play. It was rules in the house. I was not supposed to play that game. And he said, come on, they'll never find out. Your parents aren't here. They'll never find out that you played that game. And I was a little bit older at this point. 
And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And that's the point where I really realized I didn't just listen because I was afraid of them because <laughs> I was going to get in trouble. But now I also understood I realized why he doesn't want me to play that game. It moved from fear to respect. I found that what he says is true. And as, especially as I'm older now, I can look back at the rules they set for me. And yeah, every single one of them was just as they should be. I'm thankful for the way I was raised. And that's sometimes that's the greatest praise we can give to God. Obedience says, Lord, I believe you know better than I do. I know that I would rather do this, and you've called me to do that. I'm going to obey because I believe you're right. I believe you're God. And I've said this many times. The reason we should obey God is not because he has proved it and gave us a presentation and said it's right, because he's God. I believe he sees things from a different perspective than I do, and he knows more. He, he's, he's been alive longer than I've been alive. He has more wisdom than I have. I believe when he says something, he's right, so I'm going to obey him. One of the greatest ways that I can worship and praise the Lord is just obey him. And as we get to uh, Psalms 100, because my time is quickly running out, verse 1 and 2 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. It says, come into his presence. I think that there's a praise in come into the house of God. I think that there's praise into, I, hey, I know God meets here. I want to go see him. God can meet you anywhere. God can meet you in your home, in your prayer closet. God can meet you anywhere. But I think there's a praise that says, hey, God is meeting there. I want to come to where he is. Just the same as it's, it's supportive to somebody else when they're having an event, you show up. It supports them. It gives them strength. It sees, hey, this person agrees with what I'm doing. It's, it's something that I can see they're supporting me when you show up. So if we know God meets with people here, when we show up, even our very presence is saying, Lord, I believe in you. I want to support what you're doing. I want to be where your presence is. I can praise the Lord by coming to his presence. And I would like to put a little caveat on that. It doesn't mean if I just show up and sit down and let God do what he wants to, that's praise. Because if, if somebody's holding an event and I just come in and find somewhere to sit and don't do anything the whole event, I didn't support very much. Because when the pastor preaches, my support is not sitting there and staring. My support is, amen, yes, sir. That's my support. I'm, I'm giving some effort towards, I'm putting some effort towards. So coming into his presence is praise because I can come in and lift my hands and say, I praise you, Lord. I believe in you. Whatever you want to do in this service, I believe in you. I can support what's going on. Verse 3, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I believe a great form of praise, learn about the Lord. Know the Lord. Because for you to say, I'm doing a good job, but you know nothing about me, that you, you, you know, like if you, I'll put it this way. This is about the best way I can put it. I'm teaching in Sunday school right now. If you was to walk out and didn't hear a word that I ever taught and then come back in and say, you did a good job, it doesn't, it doesn't mean as much because you didn't hear, you didn't, you didn't learn anything about what I just said. And so you're saying doing a good job doesn't mean as much. And so if we don't know anything about the Lord, if we don't put some effort forth to learn about him, to see what he's doing, to, to grow and learn about him, then when we say, amen, praise the Lord, he's like, you wasn't even listening. You, wasn't even, you didn't even hear about me. You didn't learn about me. So one of the greatest forms of praise is, Lord, I want to know you. I, I want to read this word. I want to know you. I want to know what you're doing. I want to learn of you. That's praise. Um, I, I, even that old saying says, uh, one of the greatest forms of, uh, one of the greatest forms of flattery is imitation because when somebody really wants to be like somebody else, they start imitating them, you know, like a little kid finds a role model and they start dressing like them and they pick up all the same tools that they have, you know, like the old picture of the little kid with his little, little tykes hammer sitting there with his dad, who's got the real hammer. Because when you find somebody to look up to, you start imitating. You start being like them. Well, you can't imitate the Lord unless you know how he is. Unless you start learning about him, you can't imitate him. So I believe one of the greatest ways we can praise the Lord is learn of him. Learn what he's doing. Try to figure out what he's doing. And the very last one, one that's very, very common, is 
Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. There's not a point where we could say thank you enough to the Lord. The whole reason I exist is because of the Lord. The reason I'm the way I am is because of the Lord. The reason I have a future is because of God. I think one of the greatest forms of praise is just thankful, being thankful. God, thank you. Um, even you may, you may have heard this or not because families oftentimes, one of the biggest problems that a lot of families have is they feel underappreciated because you do so much. You know, even some marital problems or even you've ever heard, of, I mean, how many times have you got frustrated at your kids for how much you do for them? They didn't even say thank you. Sometimes just simply saying thank you is a lot. It means a lot. Now, God doesn't have emotions that are as wild as we are, so he doesn't go off the handle as much. But sometimes some of the greatest praise we can give him is just say, Lord, you remember when you did this for me? Thank you. I I don't want that moment to go by without saying thank you. Truly, Lord, you, you saved me. Thank you. Lord, you gave me peace when I was really upset. Thank you. Or uh, even if it's something as small as uh, we, had a, we had a member of the family who lost one shoe. And God kind of helped them find that shoe. Even something so small. Just thank you, God. Even if it seems small to somebody else, but it's big to God. Thank you. Wh- wh- whatever it is, we need to be able to thank the Lord. So let's remember that God is greatly to be praised. Because he has done some wonderful, wonderful things for us. And we can praise him. Let's, and you know, I'd say it this way. Let's put some of those in action in this service. Let's see if we can be thankful. Let's see if we can praise the Lord in all of those good ways. So I hope I've said something this morning that has helped somebody. He is greatly to be praised. Let's praise him in this service this morning. God bless you.